is good to see you guys. You doing well? No. Um, no, no, it's, it's, it's cool because, you know, we're an honest church. So if you're not doing well, I don't want you to clap and make noise. I mean, this has been a rough week. Uh, I just, I want to let you know it's all, it's all in perspective. Uh, I want to pray right now, and, and maybe this will be beneficial to you, but um, Keith just said that Carthage is launching, and they're today, they're going 9.30 and 11.15, but they're without power. So wouldn't you know that you launch, this is your first Sunday to kick off, and then uh, they don't have any power. So generator, we have some servants. Man, can I just say, we have some servants here just jumping in and helping. Um, Ed Priest, Sean O'Dowd, they're like, they're on a van, a couple of generators, gas, uh, extension cords, uh, handheld lights, just packing up and going. So I want to pray for them, uh, for their hearts and just the people. And then if you've had a bad week, we can just pray for you in that encouragement uh, as well. So come on, join me. Father, we just ask in Jesus' name that we thank you that we don't stand on circumstances, but we stand on the word of God. And your word says that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church gathering. And so, Father, we just ask in Jesus' name that there would be a fresh hope and a fresh encouragement to your people out at Carthage, that this would not be a, uh, a discouragement to their own hearts. There would be a hope for eternity. When we're persecuted and we suffer and we have trials and tribulations of many kinds, there is joy that's accessible. And so, Father, we just ask right now in Jesus' name that all of CORE uh, out of Carthage, uh, the, the team out there, would just encourage one another, look to you, realize that heaven is a beautiful place that needs to come right here on earth, no matter the storms or any other uh, prevailing entities. And Father, if there's people in this room that have had tough weeks, Father, I pray for the word of God, the distribution of the seed to come find good soil in our heart. Come on, pray for yourself right now. Father, I pray that we would be good recipients so that you would do a good work 30, 60, 100 fold through our hearts, bearing fruit, fruit that lasts. Come on, somebody, in Jesus' name, somebody said, amen, amen, amen. Hey, listen, I have a lot to cover. Uh, I haven't been up here for a couple days, so and my heart is packed, you know what I mean? And I, I think you need to get your, your journal, open it up, your hearts, prepare them, your minds, get ready, because uh, I got a message for you. Uh, just by fair invitation, listen, I, I know you guys are feeling this. I know there's a, there's a bit of anticipation in the house not just here at Grace, but like all over the place. The Lord just continued to increase this revival that we're, that we're moving in, increase of his presence over your life. And I wanna, I really, uh, today is really like a, a forecasting. What's coming uh, in September, October, through the fall timeframe is we're launching a series called City Renewal, and we're, we're taking the presence of God out to our cities and not just containing them in these walls. We're gonna be talking about serving projects. We're gonna be talking about how, how we do groups out here during the week, during the day, and how those small groups can actually make a huge difference in the, the city, in your city where you are. And so we're gonna be doing a groups fair and we've done a group training and all that. Um, but the whole point is that, listen to me, discipleship is the context in which we steward this revival. I didn't say services is how we're gonna steward this revival. Like, if we do more church services and we pack out this house and we do more chairs, that's not how we're stewarding the revival that God's bringing already. It's through discipleship, through relationships, in your house, in your work. Come on, I want you to think creatively. It's not just gonna be packed here on one of the campuses. It's, it's not gonna be confined here to a church service to, to the time that we have. It's gonna be stewarded by the very presence of us gathering together to be the church, amen? I mean, this is a philosophical change for some of you, but some of you guys have heard me talk about this for quite some time. And I'm getting you guys ready for the fall, but I'm telling you right now, August, August is a time for us that I, I just truly believe needs to be a time of consecration. And I know that may be like a big word, and like this is just not common language for us, but don't worry, it's actually in the Bible, it's in scripture, mostly in the Old Testament, but consecration is a time of setting apart. It's, it's setting, your, setting your eyes and fixing your gaze towards Jesus, but it's also away from the things that distract you. And that's what I wanna talk about today. But I wanna get you guys ready because all of August, I believe, I just, I wanna take this time and prepare our hearts really well and just, and do some good pastoring so all of us are on the same page going into this city renewal. We need to be having a season of consecration. 
away from the things that do not honor the Lord, away from the things that you and I both know if you were to talk about them and you were to disclose them, they wouldn't be honoring, and towards the things of God. It's not just reading your Bible more. It's not legalism. And it's also not just like trying to, trying to move away from sin. It's simultaneously giving your life over so that you can uh, get, be empowered to move away from the things that don't honor the Lord. Amen. Consecration is, there's a, another definition of it, and it's a, giving something a singular focus. Giving something a, 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 a purpose, a singular purpose. And when you think, uh, let me just give you a quick analogy just so you can explain this, because when it comes to the human heart, that's kind of hard to do. But when you, when you give brushes, you're probably really familiar with brushes in your household. You've got hair brushes, you know what I'm talking about? You've got paint brushes. You've got brushes that scrub your toilet, right? And you also have a toothbrush. A toothbrush is, is consecrated. It is, it is solely for the purpose of one use. Are you with me? You wouldn't take your toothbrush. You know where I'm going. You wouldn't go clean other things. You wouldn't go use it to clean your tires and the inside of your car and scrub your toilet and then, yeah, it's, just, it's gross, isn't it? I can't even finish the sentence. Like consecrating things is, is giving our hearts and our life a singular focus. We gotta stop messing around with things that just are, literally are killing our heart. We, we have to be prepared for what the Bible actually talks about. God loves certain things but he also hates certain things. And our heart needs to love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates. So there will be, I'm just telling you right now, there will be an increase of these desires because God works out the desires of our hearts as we delight in him. But let me just tell you, uh, through August, maybe even dipping into September, I don't know how long we're gonna go, but there's just a few uh, topics that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, they're real lighthearted. They're like spiritual warfare. We're gonna be talking about the fear of the Lord, breaking strongholds, healing and deliverance, and the war that we're in engaged in right now. Again, you know, just like coffee top, you know, just having people over. Hey, man, how's that sandwich? Let's talk about spiritual warfare. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're just going to get in it. Yeah, I feel like we're just ready. Are we ready? We're just, I just feel like we're ready. I hope the 930 is not going to be more ready than the 8 a.m. I'm just stoking you up a little bit here. But today, I've got a, uh, I don't always, but I have a title message for you guys. Um, I don't always have a title, but I have a title for you. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. It is How to Tame a Lion. How, yeah, I mean, I'm just telling you, like, let's just jump in. We're talking about spiritual warfare, and we're talking about the fear of the Lord. But today, don't, don't look too far ahead. Today, come on, I want you to say this with me, How to Tame a Lion. Now, let me just tell you where this title comes from. I read a book recently, and uh, inside this book, it was actually just a little paragraph, and it was talking about, it literally titled, How Do You Tame a Lion? He said he, re he read a book and uh, didn't know this before, but have you ever recognized an animal tamer going into the uh, area with a lion, and they have usually three different things on them. They have a whip to keep the lion at a distance. On the hip, they have a gun in case the lion gets too close obvious reasons, but they have one other thing. I don't know if you've ever recognized this, and you probably have to go back to your circus days, but the third thing that they usually have is a stool. You guys remember this? They have a whip in one hand and a stool in the other, and they keep sticking the stool in the face of the lion. And I, I just thought, you know, personally, I figured it was because of circus budget cuts. You know, they, they were like, hey, listen, we found a lion on the side of the road. You look like you're strong enough. I don't know what you need for a shield. Just pick up that stool, and uh, hopefully that'll defend yourself. But that's actually not it. So the book actually talks about the reason why they have a stool is because of the four edges get stuck in the face of a lion, and the lion tries to focus on all four of them at the same time, and it paralyzes the strength of the lion. Come on, are you catching this? I'm going somewhere. This isn't like a random story. Listen, let me just tell you, Proverbs 28, one, you need to take this down. Proverbs 28, one says the righteous, I want you to say this with me, it's, it's up here, it's the very last line. The righteous are as bold as a, you have a lion inside of you. 
You have the righteousness of God when you give your life to Jesus. You have a, a sin background that literally becomes change when you put your faith in Jesus. Oh my. I mean, you gotta catch this. You have the righteousness of God. Whenever you walk around, God is literally looking on the earth and saying, that's Jesus. He is made in the image of me. He has the power of the kingdom within him. You walk around with the very presence of God and the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus up from the dead dwells inside of individuals. This is the righteousness you have. But I'm just telling you right now, Paul also warns you. He says, we are not ignorant of Satan's schemes. We, you know, that word schemes is actually the mindset and the purpose of, of what the, uh, of the enemy over your life does. What does he do? He sticks things in your face to get distracted. Because, hey, you should focus on this. It's good over here. You should focus on this thing over here. No, no, no. You should really look at this. You should look at all four of them at the same time. Why? Because this is how you tame lions. This is how you subdue the very power and the presence of God in your life. You get pulled in so many different directions. You're like, I'm useless and I'm weary. Like there are so many people right now that are just weary. Why? Because they're all over the place with all kinds of distractions. Christians, like I'm telling you, followers of God, church right now, Big C, Capital Church, you're seeing it all over the place. In America, God is just cleaning house. And it is sad. Like, honestly, it is sad to see some of the leaders being like, no, oh, like my heart breaks. Like, what is happening right now? But then you look at other places of the country in UK, in places in Ireland, they're literally seeing parts of revival. People are packing out prayer meetings, not just church services. I mean, people are, are in the underground churches meeting because they're getting persecuted because they can't meet publicly. And here we are, we can barely make it in the comfort of our own home. I mean, we're building churches all over the place in America, but where are the people that actually are the church? Where are the ones that are the righteousness of God? Where are the ones that are bold? Like this is the idea that God is stoking up inside of us, and I'm just telling you right now, do not be distracted. These next coming months, there's gonna be some distractions for you. There's gonna be some things that are gonna try to inundate your mind and your heart and literally just move you off course. The enemy, Satan wants to absolutely overwhelm you, but not like an elephant overwhelms an ant. No, 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 by just distractions. He just, he knows that there's a lion inside of you. Listen, Satan has better theology than you. And so the only thing he has to empower you is just to focus on other things besides him. I'm just gonna stick this in your face because I just want you to focus. Look over here. Hey, look at this, look at this. Look at this. Hey, look, 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 look. He's like, no, stop. Look, I, I know you and I have to know the power that is inside of us. You are called to bring down the heavens. You are called to destroy the works of Satan. You are called to trample on serpents and scorpions. You're called to walk in authority. Like this is where we are. This is who we are. This is our identity. It's not something that we do when we become professional Christians. It's who we are everywhere we go. If you're parents, your job is not to fight with your kids. It's to fight for them. It's to pray over them. This is the generation that's coming up. Look, you know, over, the, uh, over on the other side of these doors in the hallway, we don't do childcare. Like, we don't just watch your kids so you can get entertained for a minute. We are pouring into your kids because we believe that the kingdom of God, what Jesus says, the kingdom of God belongs to these. Like we have another generation raising up and we need to take our job at home and at schools and wherever you guys are, seriously. Like there's nothing else that's gonna turn over these cities. Listen, I, I, I've got this later on in my notes. It just seems fitting right here. I, I feel like just telling you and reminding you, this is not a criticism. And I'm not against anything that I'm about to tell you. But if God wanted to restore humanity through power, then Jesus would have come as a militant leader overtaking the Roman guard. If God wanted to restore humanity through politics, then he would have become a president and operated as such. If he wanted to operate and restore humanity through business, then Jesus would have been an opener of all entrepreneurship in America and the world. That's not how he came. He came as a human so that we can have a relationship with God, 
having the Holy Spirit relating to other people because that's how he plans on restoring. It's not a, it's not a system. So I'm just telling you right now, do not be distracted by the things that are coming. Look, I'm not ignorant, and we're not talking about politics and things up here. I'm not gonna be telling you how to vote, what to vote, who to vote for. We're not gonna be uh, inundated with things in November because there is something much more important happening in our lives. I don't want you to get distracted with things that you can see because you miss the things that you don't see because it's eternal. Like our hearts need to be set and trusted on the very word of God. I'm telling, I've said this before, we are not a news agency. So you don't have to keep emailing me to say, hey, we need to address this. We, I am, we are addressing the most important thing, the word of God in our hearts. Like there is nothing else that's gonna change the streets if we just going out and we just keep, hey, you know what they did? Can I, can, let me give you an update. From a Christian perspective, this is what happened. No, 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 I need to tell you, this is what God wants to do in our lives right here, right now. I mean, we wanna stoke up revival. We wanna see the presence of God. We can't be distracted because that's exactly what the enemy wants to do in your life. So let me just go to a really common, uh, really common story, and I'm, I'm believing that it's gonna be fresh for you guys today. Luke chapter 10, Mary and Martha. You guys familiar with this story? <laughs> Mary and Martha. All right, let's just read it. I, I bet there's gonna be something in here for us now that I got you guys all riled up. Verse 38. Oh, we're starting in 40. Do we have 38? Oh, sweet. Now as they uh, went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Don't you appreciate Martha's? I mean, I think they get a bad rap in this story. I'm going to explain a little bit, but I mean, come on. I'm not trying to paint in your corner. Martha's solid. You know she gets corrected by Jesus, but correction's not bad. Can I just pause right now? I mean, listen, if, you're, if you have been over this past week, past couple days, past month, past year of your life, if you've been corrected by the Lord, don't, don't ever, don't ever connotate correction with an unloving God who's a dictator. He disciplines those he loves. So if anything, Martha's getting loved on here in a little bit. So I, I don't want you to connotate discipline and correction as something that God is not interested in. He comes really close, like a father to a child, and he disciplines and he corrects. He only chastises those sons and daughters that he's, that he's uh, really close with. And um, Martha welcomed all of them into her house, verse 39, and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to his teaching. But Martha was distracted. Somebody say distracted. With, many, with, much, with much serving, and she went up to Jesus, Lord, that's a good name. I mean, if you wanna get his attention, he's not like rabbi, it's not teacher. I mean, I know you're gonna drop something real good here in the house, I know it's gonna be a really good message, it's gonna be a great response, I'm, I'm looking forward to your sermon notes, but that's not what she said. She said, you're, you're my Lord. And, then, and this is what she said, Lord, do you not care? Stop right there. Have you, ever, have you ever just instigated your prayer time? Hey, Lord, listen, you're like two years overdue right now. I've been praying and pressing in. I've even listened to these messages and saying, you, there's five steps to a breakthrough. I've done all 10 of them twice already. I should have my breakthrough by now. And so what you do is you instigate your prayers and say, I, I, I can see what's happening. You just don't care. Come on, are you, have, you, have you been there before? That's where Martha is. What, what Martha is about to give to Jesus, the Lord and Savior, the creator of heaven and earth, is directives on how it should be operated. You need to tell Mary to help me because you don't care about me. I'm, I'm helping you care. I'm, listen to Martha's translation. I'm helping you be a better God. Are you catching this? How many times have we done this? How many times have we been like, hey, I am frustrated, I'm angry. I'm not saying you shouldn't be angry with the Lord. I'm not saying you can't be, you can't be frustrated with it. You can. But listen to me. Your job, our job as humans is not to understand what God does. It's to just be with him. You, we need to be able to trust God, not know what he's doing. There is a whole bucket load of mystery when it comes to the presence of God. I mean, there, there's a whole presence there's a description inside of God, inside of his word, that's, it's called holy. He's holy. He's, he's just other. He's not like you and me. He doesn't 
think like you. He doesn't do things like you and me. Listen, in Isaiah 55, it says that his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His ways are higher than your ways. So why in the world would we be like, hey, I know what's happening. around. I know exactly what God's doing. No, you don't. Because he's God and you're, well, you're not. So we need to stop trying to play God. Are you catching this? I mean, this is just a humbling, uh, 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 scripture is humbling. And it just puts us right where we need to be. And so here's Martha. Hey, don't you care? Tell Mary to do something. God, I'm helping you be God. And then, and then Jesus. I'm so glad Jesus is Jesus because I would have said something else to Martha. You know what I'm saying? Martha, are you kidding me right now? You know what I'm saying? But Jesus, full of love, man, full of grace, full of truth. This, this is what he said. Uh, Jesus said, said, Lord, do you not care? And then, and then verse 40, uh, 41, Martha, Martha. You're anxious and troubled about many things. You're distracted about much, but you're anxious about many things. She's got a lot going on. Uh, and, then, and then she says this, but there's one thing that's ne- necessary. And Mary, Jesus says, Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. What's Jesus saying is, we pray this prayer. We, we were taught this prayer. God, give us our daily bread. You know what our daily bread is? It's the word of God. Man doesn't live on what? Bread alone, but by every word. Every, we, we operate, we live on the word of God. Jesus says, if, when you listen to my word, that's what you can hold on to. Because listen, the grass will wither. Come on, somebody. The flowers will fade, but the word of God, tucked in our hearts and our mind, will last. That's what you need to hold on to. So in the next coming months, what's going to happen? Distractions. I don't know what they are, but the enemy knows who you are, and they know how to operate, and they know how to distract you. And he's, he's going to try to overwhelm you. His, his intent, his purpose over your life is to kill you. It's to steal from you, and it's to take you out, devouring you. And so how is he going to do that? Just small, subtle distractions. Focus on this. Look over here. And what we need to do is be fixed and abiding in the Word of God. Father, what are you talking to me right now? What is today? Who do you want to be for me? God, what is my daily bread? Where do you want me to go? Holy Spirit, you empower me. You give me the mind of Christ. What do you want me to think about? Constantly just walking through, praying in the Spirit. When you don't know what to pray, pray in the Spirit. When you don't know what to do, pray at all times. You want to know the will of God? Give thanks, pray, and give praise every single moment in every circumstance. This is with the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so here is the enemy trying to come up and just tame the righteousness inside of you. Tame the lion that's inside of you. Tame the righteousness that is Jesus that wants to come out and do destruction to the darkness in your family and in the city. But the enemy is like, yeah, but only if you could just do religious things. Only if you could be distracted. Only if you can go to church but not really hang out with Jesus. Only if you can read the word but not actually get the word inside of me. Come on, somebody. Only if you would just pray and think that you're actually doing something. But the heart of God is actually communing, listening to him and speaking. There's a whole lot of practices that become legalism when our hearts detach from what he's asking us to do. These are not about practices. They're about the very thing that make us come alive. We come alive in the presence of God, and we need to do anything and everything just to stay abiding in his presence. Now, this isn't a new problem. This isn't like uh, Luke chapter 10, Mary and Martha are situated, like we're here in 2024. It's not a new problem. This is ancient. Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah goes hundreds of years before Jesus. And this is is what one little um, sentence says in chapter uh, 47. I love this first line. You are wearied with your many counsels. And you have a lot of counsels out there. You've got a lot of stimulus. Look at your phone. How many notifications do you get every single day? How many times do you get pulled away and distracted from just being attentive to the presence of God? Now just hear me for a second, because I'm not like advocating that you quit everything, that you leave your spouse, that you go out to the mountain and become a monk and be like, all right, this is it. No distractions. I have figured it out. This is the mountaintop experience that Jesus was talking about. No, no, no. Jesus came out off the mountain, came down to the valley, was surrounded with people. He was even in a storm at one point in time, and he was still aware of the presence of God. Listen, this is not being detached from the world. It's being in the world, but your heart being of heaven. You're citizens of heaven. 
That's why we need to just keep our mentality fixed in the heavens to bring that stuff down. Are you at work? Yeah, be fully at work, be there, but have the, have the awareness. God, what are you doing in our people right now? God, you say that you give us wisdom for those who ask. I'm asking for wisdom to do my job. I'm asking for wisdom to be able to know what's going on with our team. How do we best operate with these people? How, what are the, the gaps that need to be filled? Lord, you give me your insight, and insight will come. God is so good, but we have to look at these warnings. You're wearied about many counsels. Now he goes on, I'll just read the rest of this. He goes on and says, let them, he's really talking about, this whole chapter is about idols. He's talking about all the idols. Idols are anything that you and I put above God. Now the Old Testament, they could be like totem poles, they could be like golden calves. And you're like, I know what you're thinking. You're like, hey, listen, I'm good, I don't have idols. I'm just telling you right now, your house could become your idol. What you put on when you, when you leave the house, how much time you spend getting ready could be an idol. I'm saying is when you walk through your day, your phone and what comes from your phone and how much allegiance you give to that thing. The last time you freaked out when you lost your phone, you did everything just to go find it. There's a parable about finding Jesus with that tenacity. I'm saying that anything could be an idol in our lives and we just have to be aware of God. What are you doing? What are you revealing so that I can remove the high places and only give that to you? Seek first the kingdom and everything else is gonna be added to you. It's not money, it's not retirement, it's not tomorrow. Come on, we just went through James. We're not supposed to worry about tomorrow, but we should just say, Lord, if it be your will. Like this is what God's after. This isn't a, a new problem, this is ancient. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about all the idols. You're wearied with your many counsels. Let all of the idols stand forth and save you. Oh, I'm sorry, they can't. You throw one in, he talks it later on, you throw one in the fire. They can't come out of the fire and save themselves. How are they gonna save you? He says, those who divide the heavens, this is just a hearsay, those who gaze at the stars like horoscopes, come on, I'm telling you right now, if you, do, if you still look at horoscopes to tell you what kind of day, what kind of week you're having, shut them down. Like, just get rid of them. Like, this is just an ancient problem. You gaze up to the stars who at new moons you make known, hey, do you see what's going on with the weather? Yes, the weather, hear me out, the weather responds to the presence of God. Everything you see in the physical responds is a response to the very things that you don't see in the invisible, in the unseen reality. So if, if you're still messing around with tarot cards, fortune cookies, palm readers, dream catchers, crystal balls, hypnosis, horoscopes, mediums, these are just blatant evils. What, what, what we're going after with these things are an earthly wisdom. Hey, I need some counsel. I need to know what to do. So we, people seek these things. James actually says earthly wisdom is demonic. What is it? it? I'm telling you right now, it's just one of these. Check out your horoscope. Look at that fortune cookie. You don't really believe in that stuff, but just open it up to see what's in there. <laughs> what do you do with it? You smash it. You get rid of it. Like any other idol, any other sin, you flee from it. You kill sin or it's gonna be killing you. I just got one clap, man. That's good. Let's keep coming. <laughs> Listen, there, there's some good things that may distract you from all the different counsel. I mean, you, you, may have some, uh, you may have some prophetic messages. There's false prophecy that are out there. And if you just go on YouTube and put in prophetic message, what is God doing right now? You will have, I'm just guessing, you will have two million opportunities to watch all of the video content for prophetic messages out there. Can I just tell you that not all of them are from the Lord? And a lot of them have clickbait. A lot of them have uh, things that you just have to look at now. I mean, there's, there's so many things out there that are good things. I'm not talking about outright evil things. They're good things in our lives. Church, gatherings, religious things. Jesus didn't come back to restore humanity through religion. He did it through a relationship. And we need to get down to the very essentials that God's asking us to. Luke chapter 10, I'm not done with this story. Go back to verse 41, Mary, Martha. I wanna just set up a precedent for you right now that um, a lot of the spiritual writers will look at houses in scripture and affiliate those to our, our hearts because our hearts have a lot of rooms to them, don't they? 
They have a lot of levels to them. They have a lot of depth to them. They have a lot of uh, space in them. And then once you go in a room, there's closets over here. There's things tucked in over there. There's things in the drawer, things in the cabinet. Our hearts are very deep, interwoven, complicated things. Uh, our heart is, is uh, like deep waters, Proverbs says. Who can understand it, right? So when you look at the, the figures of a house like you have here with Mary and Martha and Jesus, a lot of spiritual writers will, will say that this is a depiction of the human heart. So what do we find in the human heart? Martha, Mary, and Jesus. There are tendencies inside of your life to just do. You want to accomplish things. Come on, you, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, I want you to be honest right now. You just, you just, you, you get filled up and motivated and encouraged by knocking out your to-do list. I've got so much to do and I feel so satisfied. I got my to-do list done and I did two extra things. I feel like Superman right now. You know, is anybody here? Or are you just like taking in this message and you're gonna think about it later? We have a tendency, every single person, I know that a lot of times this, this message or this, this uh, context of scripture can be taken, hey, who's Martha? Everybody raise your hand. And every once in a while, hey, who's, who's Mary? And like two people raise their hand because they pray for six hours a day. What I'm, what I'm saying is in your heart, inside of the tendencies for you and I, you have a Martha and you have a Mary. Yeah. Our deepest desire, the core of who we are, is just to sit with intimacy with Jesus. God, I just want to listen to you. I just want to be with, I would love to read the word. I would, I would love to just worship. I would love to just soak and sit. That's not life. It's not being away from everybody. Jesus had that, but he had the rhythm of going back in and loving people right where they are. And we have these pull between Martha and Mary, but in the center of our house is who? Jesus. It's his throne room, and he dictates things. So the moment that we get too busy, what does he do? He says, Martha, 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 you're anxious. Now this word anxious, in verse 41, I want to give you the definition, because it's, it's grueling. Listen to this. In, uh, in the word, the Greek word anxious, it means a word to be pulled or divided into parts, fragmented or distracted, spread thin, weary from too many things. Does that sound familiar? I mean, literally, Jesus just says, Martha, Martha, you, there's a lion inside of you, and you're doing good, but you've got stuff shoved in your face right now. And, it, and he uses the word very poignantly. You're anxious about what? Many things. So the four stools, the four points that are pulling you in many directions, those have many things that are weighing your heart down. But he says, but one thing is necessary. One thing you can't have anybody take away from me. Because where your heart is, that is where your treasure is also. And so here, here Jesus is giving a little bit of correction to Martha, but it's also a sobering love. Hey, just focus on one. Please do not... Do, get distracted. I want to pass to you for a little bit. Hey, listen, I, I don't want you to be distracted by many things that are going to be coming down. I don't know what's going to be coming down the pike. The enemy knows you better than you know yourself sometimes, but the enemy is going to try to distract you over these coming months. And I'm just telling you right now, keep to the word of God. Spend time with them. Abide with them. Keep your heart open to continue to pray. Colossians chapter 2 has different language on it, but very uh, similar. Colossians 2, 8 says this, if you guys can pull that up. Colossians 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you what? Come on, read this with me. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deception, according to the tradition of men. According to, ele this is what I want to get to, the elementary principles of the world instead of or versus or in comparison to what you're supposed to be, which is Christ himself. The elementary spirits are the way, listen to me really carefully, the way you used to operate before Jesus. This is elementary. This is whenever you used to do kindergarten and first grade before you met Jesus. How did you do that? Well, I'm telling you right now, you used to think that the world operates from only what you can see. When you wake up, you're like, this is it. This is my reality. It's food, it's my parents, and then that's it. But now you're an adult. You are you're introduced to a spiritual reality. Your reality is more of what you don't see than what you can see. Don't be distracted with the elementary spirits. The consequences of your actions, this is elementary thought process. The consequences of your actions only affect you. you know, as a kid, you're like, I can do whatever I want to because my parents will clean it up. This is just infantile, elementary spirit type of thinking. We just think that our consequences only deal with, they don't. Like your sin that you're holding around, your, your secret lifestyle, sin will be revealed. Everything that is hidden will be coming to light. 
This is not how we operate anymore. Like you are the only one in the world that it operates around. Like your opinion matters other, more than anybody else's. Like you need to look out for yourself because nobody else's. These are elementary principles. Everything changes when you get into the gospel. You have a God who watches over you. You don't have to watch out for yourself. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to fight for yourself because you have a God who contends on your behalf. You are the righteousness. If you're in a storm, he's not gonna forget about you. And so here's what he says the next chapter over, chapter three, verse two, very practical. Let me just give you some advice. He says, keep your mind, keep your mind, chapter three, verse two, set your mind on the things above, not the things on earth. So what are we talking about? Your thought process. Over this coming months, I'm telling you right now, keep your thought processes fixed to the word of God and what God's doing. The second one is your eyes. Second Corinthians chapter four, don't look at the things seen, but the things unseen. What are you focused on? What are you dictating reality on? Can I just tell you right now that I'm just preparing you. Over the next couple months, you're gonna physically see some things that you think, wow, I can't believe that happened. Yes, you can. Everything that you see in the physical starts and is birthed in the unseen. So if you wanna operate under the peace of God that rule and reigns over your heart, pray. Just pray. Ask the Lord, God, what are you doing right now? I, I, this is what I see Lord, what are you doing? Show me where this came from. Are you following me? I'm gonna keep my mind fixed on you, but show me where this came from. God, I, there's no fear that comes in here. You wanna know why? Because perfect love occupies this station and perfect love casts out fear. There's no fear. The fear is a spirit that comes to try to what? Distract you. It, it just distracts you. So th this, is, this is what we're going after. This is what we're going after. So if you guys could, we just got a couple minutes, not very long, but that's all the Lord needs. Can you guys just um, stand with me? And I want you just, just to get into hard to receive. I wanna pray, I wanna pray some stuff over you. Just don't, don't move yet. Don't leave. I just want you to be still before the Lord. We're just gonna do like a, a couple minutes of response. I just want you to close your eyes and just focus in on the Lord right now. Don't be distracted. First thing I, I just want you to walk through is, is if you've never given your life over to Jesus you got to realize you're ruling over your own heart. And you can't do that. You've never given your life over to Jesus. Today, you just feel like the Lord's moving you to that. I want you just to, to surrender, to submit to him so that he can become your father. If that's you today, just let him know. Lord, I want you to become my father. I want you to be Lord and Savior over my entire life. I want you to be everything to me. I want you to speak to me. I want you to guide me. I want you to wake me up. I want you to speak to me in your scripture. I want to you to have your Holy Spirit inside of me so I can be led and guided. Whatever that looks like, just fully come over to him. Say, Father, you come in. You come in. The next thing I want you to do is just recognize if there's anything that has distracted you, anything that's pulled you away, just give it to him right now. Lord, I just put down my phone. I put down, come on, you just name it. I put down TV. I put down this relationship. I put down that anger. I put down this unforgiveness. I put down this bitterness that's trying to, to birth inside of my heart. Whatever it is, I don't know. I, don't, I can't put words in your mouth. What is it? What is taking you away from just abiding and trusting? And there's a, a few things I really felt like the Lord wanted us to go after today. So, so this, is, um, this is just an impartation. If you know you need to live boldly for Jesus and you're just not, 
and you just need the righteousness to come out like a lion, if you just want the Holy Spirit to continue to lead and to fill you up and empower you way more than you ever have, I want you just to get into a place to receive. Put your hands up, open them up, open up your heart, um, get your face on the floor, hit the knees, come up to the altar, whatever it looks like. You just get into a posture to say, God, I want more of your Holy Spirit. I want more of your power. I want more of the lion inside. I want more righteousness. I want more of you. I, I have a lot. I have plenty, but I just want more. If there's a hunger that's just not yet satisfied, if you know you have a destiny and you want every single day to be reminded of where you're going, what God's doing in your life, you want to see the call of God to set the captives free in your life. You want the very serving individuals and, and loving on them to be supernatural works of God in your life. If that's you, I just want you to come into a posture somehow to say, God, that's me. I want want to keep my eyes fixed on you. Father, we ask right now that your children, your sons, your daughters would be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can have the mind of God, so that we can take Paul's actions and not just know them, but live them, keeping our mind and our eyes fixed on you. Father, in Jesus' name, we just pray that you would implant the word to be having our mind fixed and stayed on you. Father, we pray that your people right now would become bold as lions, that they would enter a time of consecration, that they would enter a time to just a singular focus on why they exist. Father, we rebuke any forms of anxiety and worry right now that would try to move us away. Father, we repent of all the elementary spirits that we have operating in our life and in our mindset and in the philosophy. And God, I pray that you would substitute it with very truth so that our mind and our heart should be fixed over on the things of God. Father, I pray that we will not get distracted by the things that we see, but we will, we will own and fix our eyes on the things unseen. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that we would be overwhelmed by your goodness. In Jesus' name, we'd be overwhelmed by your goodness. Father, let truth be our guidepost. Let truth be our guidepost.